All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, for Jennifer, for uh, the instruction, for having me. Um, this is really great because yesterday when I got on, we were 20 minutes late. So I, uh, um, yeah, we're, so we're good. Um, so um, we've talked a lot today about feasibility studies and remedial action objectives and, and selecting remedies. So the next 40 minutes and wrapping up is going to be, well, after remedy selection into the implementation. And, and there's a number of pieces that even go with, with that. You know, there's the design, uh, any and additional investigations, which we're going to talk about, uh, bench and pilot scale studies, um, and, and then also talking about the implement, implementation and, and, and delivery methods. Uh, and when I was putting this together, I, I, I struggled a little bit about just the order of, of the slides. And anyone who printed out the slides or has them in front of you, you're going to see what, what's presented today. They're, they're the order. Um, they're basically the same content, but they're, they're reordered. Because I, I I had a little bit, had a hard time thinking about what the right order is because it's not chronological it's it's often very iterative, and you may do do our design and but then do some additional investigation realizing you have data gaps or maybe you do a pilot scale study and then you realize I need to go collect more more investigation, um, and maybe your your investigation your pilot test your you're testing different uh, delivery methods and or maybe you do an implementation. And you realize you need to change the technology, so you're going to go back and do more bench scale studies. So it's all very iterative, and and it's non sequential often at times. So feasibility studies are, are looking at uh, time to meet goals and 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 cost, and generally we'll find that the, these these time the time frame for treatment or closeout, which which is estimated, is inversely proportional to cost. Um, and and that can vary based on what the starting concentrations are if you've got really low criteria um, the size of the plume if you just have source area or if you've got a, a, a large large uh, groundwater impacted area but one of the things that you'll, you'll find um, and this is from a image from a groundwater monitoring remediation uh, report that came out a few years ago um, is that feasibility studies often underestimate the, the time and or the cost of, of actually doing the remediation at these sites, where these blue dots are about an average of, of what was estimated. Um, and you see that those time frames or the costs are, are, are longer or more expensive. And, and, and what can we do uh, to implement best practices? It goes back to what Mike Molly was talking about this morning in terms of state of the art versus state of the practice of, of actually putting that focus into the remediation design and, and, and choosing the right methods. Um, to, to improve our overall process, more effective cleanups, more cost-effective cleanups, and, and to be able to do them on time and on budget. Uh, so th there's been various uh, Im similar images to this this morning of, of the typical waste site cleanup process, the RI into the FS. Um, and and we, we think about well, what are the major questions that are that are answered um, or asked dur during these different phases? And, and the RI is looking at well, what are the contaminants, where are they, uh, who's at risk is, is the question of the risk assessments. Uh, the FS, as I said, uh, looks at, well, how, how long might it take? How much might it cost? But it's not really until you go to af after the FS, and oftentimes after you've already chosen your remedy for a site or, or the technology, that anyone really ever dives into the question of, how are we really going to treat any site? And, and how well do we understand the source area of the treatment zones? And, and, and more often than not, um, uh, is is that th these processes are a bit like a relay race where you're passing a baton from one team or one individual. You're, you have the RI team, and then the risk assessors come in, and then you have an FS team, and then you give it to the remedial design or the remedial action team. And and and, and in this image, I show Usain Bolt. He's the fastest man in the world. But unless you've got a whole team behind him, and if, if one step is is not um, as strong as 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 in others, you may not win the race. Um, and, and a better analogy for a, a team is, is more like a four-person crew boat, where you have all of your team members working together from the beginning. You have your remediation engineers as part of the RI, helping to collect certain data, uh, giving your full data set while you're mobilized. Uh, you, you have your, your geologist and your RI team who is out on site, and they know the logistics of the site involved in the remedial design. They're involved in the remedial action. You're getting the risk assessors involved early, so they also have enough information gets collected as the RI. So again, it's 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 all rowing together, so we, we get these effective remediation cleanups. So how do we get a successful remediation? And and I think it's it's kind of a one two three easy, right? But but it, it's never that easy. But 
the three most critical steps are treatment area characterization. Um, and and, it, and that's in, it includes doing investigation as part of your remote design. Um, and that is me out many, many moons ago, uh, collecting data, doing a remedial investigation um, on, on a large Superfund site. We take that data and whether it's, it's the order can, can vary, as I said earlier, but you, you take all the data that you have from the site um, and you go, go back and you do your remedial design. And what you really want to make sure is that remedial design is based on that conceptual site model, based on all the data that you've collected, the, the chemistry, the geology. Um, and then you implement the remedial action. You're actually utilizing various tools to implement the design that you spend so much time and so much cost to prepare. Uh, you can have the best design with the right dosages that are optimized and, and, and your activating agents and, and your volumes and, and your, your intervals. But unless you have the right tools to implement that design and, and deliver those amendments, um, your remedial action may fail. And we're going to talk a lot more about remedial tools um, later on in this presentation. So thinking about the remedial design investigation, um, one of the biggest things that, that has to be grasped with is, is the, the resolution required is so much higher for mediation than it is for delineation. I, I've been fighting this for, for years and, and you get clients, you get project managers you say, well, we just spent a million dollars on an RI and you're telling me the data gaps? Um, but the RI is not answering the same or asking the same question that the remedial design needs to. Um, delineation is just looking, is, is the contamination present and maybe what concentrations and, and where is it? But the remediation really has to understand how to remove those contaminants. And, and ultimately, the goal is, is to develop a surgical remediation plan. Um, this this, this uh, image here on the left um, is, a, is a diesel range uh, site where remedial design calculation was done, where uh, soil samples were collected. And they were collected on, on approximately a one foot vertical interval. So instead of collecting your geoprobe sleeve and, and, and grabbing one sample per five foot, and, and remember most times VOC samples are collecting about that much soil. So whether you got this, this soil or that soil or the soil down here, you may get vastly different concentrations. You're at least collecting samples on, on, a, on, a, on a one foot interval. So within your five foot sleeve, you're getting four to five samples um, just to get a better sense of where the contamination is and actually quantify that. Um, and you can see that, don't worry about the numbers, but you can see the different, the different colors uh, uh, to coded to different concentrations. And you can see even from sample to sample, one foot apart, I mean, and again, that, that's maybe this and then this, um, you're seeing orders of magnitude concentration difference. High resolution uh, uh, tools are, are very commonly used now. They're very powerful tools. Richard talked about some of the, some of the characterization and, and having centimeter scale resolution. That is great data to have, but I, I, I would highly recommend not developing a remedial design entirely on high resolution contamination data and or high resolution characterization data and, and, and the, the blobs that, that some of the visual tools come out of that. Um, it's when we integrate that data and, and we, we take our high, sa high sample density, um, then we, we combine that with uh, the resolution, uh, high resolution site characterization tools, as well as the soil lithology and the geology. Um, it was great to see Mike Marley this morning and then Richard this afternoon talk about the importance of understanding the geology. And, and I, I want to stand up here as, as, again, just reiterating the importance of geology to remediation, to the fit and transport of the chemicals, to implementing designs. Um, so that, that's when, when you, when you integrate all of this data, that's how you develop a, a strong conceptual site model that's going to help drive and, 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 and focus your remediation design and then, then your actual remedial action. So bench scale testing is, is another important aspect to, to achieving uh, effective uh, site remediation. Um, so just on, on a basic scale, it's, it's testing conducted in the laboratory setting. And it may or may not use site data. Uh, there's, there's plenty of sites where you just use some spiked samples uh, looking at certain contaminants. Um, and and so, the bench scale treatability tests can be can be quite complex, or they can be very simple. They can be in a batch. They can be a flow through reactor, um, and and you could have little 40 mil vol vials of water only um, to having very large samples collected or doing reactors in five gallon buckets or, or flow through columns that could be feet long, um, and and the duration can can even vary. They they can be hours to to months even, um, and and it allows to testing of various conditions as well as different technologies if, if needed. 
in general, it, it's, it's not a rule of thumb, but in general, um, Bench testing is most valuable and most effective when there's questions about the chemistry or the biology for the site. Is a, is a certain amendment going to be effective? Uh, is a contaminant biodegradable uh, aerobically, anaerobically, maybe both? Um, what's the best amendment or, or maybe activating agents, uh, various oxidants? Um, you you want to be able to have a certain catalyzing or activating agent with that, and and, and what, what is the best one? Is, is, is persulfate, for example, is it base? Is it peroxide? Is it heat? Um, is it carbohydrate? That, that, that's a new activator that's being developed that Isotech is, is, has been doing a lot of testing on, and we're actually going to the field on a number of projects in the next few months on that. Um, again, which is going to be best for your given site? And th those are questions that are often very site-specific. Um, there, are there optimal dosages? Uh, is there inhibitory effects based on either some site, or maybe you're looking at a combined remedy, and, and depending on the sequence or what uh, chemicals are used in combination, um, is, is one going to going to provide a, a synergistic effect, or is it going to be inhibitory? And, and bench field tests can include actual construction, uh, destruction of the contaminants, or it could be a simple demand test, whether it's total oxidant demand, it could be chemical oxygen demand, if you're looking at aerobic bioremediation, um, or even acid or base buffering, if you have different uh, technologies that are very pH sensitive, whether it's oxidant uh, activation or even bioremediation. And, and these tools often provide us these, these questions of go, no, go. If it doesn't work in the laboratory or it's, it's quite ineffective in the laboratory, um, it's, it's, you have a less likely that, uh, chance that it's going to be effective in the fields. Um, and one other recommendation for bench scale testing is you want to include soil and groundwater. The soil is going to dominate the chemistry and the buffering um, at sites. And often the majority of organic contamin contaminants are actually absorbed to the soil itself. Um, and, and again, there's a, there's a lot of questions that a treatability test can tell you. I don't want to go through this. The, the slides are available, so I just want to provide this as, as, as reference that we can all go back to as, as references. Um, but treatability testing has, has a lot of value. Um, and I'm going to show a few uh, sam sample case studies uh, in, in a few slides down the line, and, and you'll see some of those these questions answered with those. So for field pilot tests, these, these are, as a broad definition, is the testing that's conducted in the field. Um, and it can be at one or more areas of a site. Um, and in general, uh, field pilot testing is, is recommended when there's questions about the hydrogeology, uh, the delivery of the, of the contaminant, or site-specific performance. Uh, and you can perform these in the source area. You can form it at mid-plume or down-gradient edges with, and again, across ranges of concentrations. because different portions of the site, and, and Richard's last site showed that you had different areas where it's source and mid-plume, and we had different concentrations, different hydrogeologic conditions, different uh, geochemical conditions. Um, and when you can, you try to perform your pilot testing in the more complicated, more complex areas of the site, and, and maybe that's geochemically or, or contaminant concentration, or maybe it's simply based on access. Um, and the duration for a pilot test could be a few days, um, which was the case in, in the, the, the bottom picture here, which was an SVE pilot test, or it can be up to a year, which was the case uh, in this pilot test above, which was for bioremediation. Um, and, and one of the things to think about, and, and this, this was came up in a few of the presentations about the feasibility studies and the sequence of this, um, this top picture, this pilot test was actually performed prior to the feasibility to the study. Um, and, and oftentimes feasibility studies are, are the paper design and you're doing it all desktop and then you select your remedy and then you go out and say, okay, let's, let's do a field pilot test. But there are certain questions about, well, injection, injection flow rates, it, it, is it possible? Um, does one amendment uh, work or not work? And, and in the case that Richard and the Marine presented, that was a case where probably if you did a desktop analysis alone, as I said, bioremediation probably would have won on, on, on paper. Um, but when you looked at, at various chemical parameters and then site groundwater, um, you saw that what probably would have won in the desktop study alone was not going to be the best fit for that site. And, and that, that, that's, a question, that, 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 that's a good example of where maybe doing a pilot test before doing a feasibility study can really help you dial in your, your technology alternative evaluations. So just a few more items on, on pilot studies. Um, there's a, a lot of site-specific effectiveness and, and that you can collect to, have to really optimize your remediation design. Um, and that can be in terms of delivery and distribution, especially for heterogeneous uh, geologies, 
Uh, what are your flow rates and pressures? And that can be injection of fluids or uh, liquid or air, uh, extraction, whether that's, uh, again, liquid, groundwater, or, or air. Um, what kind of spacing do you want to have in the, at the field if you're doing injection or extraction? Do you have changes to the groundwater conditions? Uh, and that could include pH or metals, which, which could have uh, inhibitory or adverse effects. Um, and, and one of the questions, and again, one of my site supervisors um, was looking through these slides and he said, you know, we, for pilot tests, the great thing to learn is just logistical coordination. Where's the hydrant? Where are you gonna get your water from? Can you drive your rig in to this area? Do you need to go clear some trees out? Are there overhead wires? How, how do we work around those? Um, and, and so th those are the, the, the questions that, that often get left out and, and just you're doing a feasibility study and you're like, oh yeah, we're, we're just going to do ISCO and it's going to be fine. But there may be all these uh, logistical questions in, into ha actually implementing it. Um, and you may or may not apply uh, regions in situ, which it could be a water only injection test. I'm going to talk about a case study for that. Um, so I, I, again, there's a lot of value to pilot studies. And when you're planning your bench or your pilot scale study, it's really important to establish what are your data quality objectives before you, you do anything or spend any money. Um, and, and really think about it. And I've, I've been involved over the years in a number of bench scale tests um, or doing review of, of bench scale or pilot tests after the fact done by others or reviewing them. And, and I've seen a number over the years that really what the what they were going to do is we're just going to add a bunch of chemicals to a, re a reactor. We're going to inject a bunch of chemicals in the ground and, and see what the data tells us. And more often than not, the conclusions of those were very inconclusive because they didn't have any real question they were going after. Um, so set up your, your bench and your pilot scale studies with what questions do you want to answer and, and make sure that you're, you're orienting your points or your dosages or your reactors or, or the, the, the analytical that you're collecting so that those questions can actually be in fact answered. And that's gonna really help you with more accurate costing and scheduling for when you get to that to the field. So a few bench scale studies. Um, this, this first one, um, it's related to surfactants. Surfactants are, are, um, have been used for a long time, but we're seeing a more interest in those in the last few years. Um, and typically on petroleum sites, but this was a, a surfactant uh, uh, that was considered for a, a chlorinated solvent site. And one of the questions was, well, can surfactants enhance desorbing PCE from soil? So this bench scale test looked at different surfactants, different dosages to, to kind of evaluate that question. Um, this middle one was looking at uh, cadmium. And, and the last case study looked at using re different reducting, reducing agents for chromium. Um, and that, th those are pretty commonly applied, but cadmium is more difficult to, to uh, precipitate out. So this was looking at different reductants and different reductant dosages of which one can achieve the lowest concentration for cadmium. Um, and then one, um, this bottom one, was for uh, a site on Cape Cod, um, and, and there's a lot of nitrate plumes on Cape Cod and, and looking for methods that can re reduce nitrate flux uh, in the groundwater going to surface water. And one of the, the, the potential technologies is to do EVO PRBs. So the question was at, at the bench scale, using a column, um, Proof of concept, does it work? Does it work for some of the high groundwater flow rates that we see on Cape Cod? Um, and then also, can EVO be made stickier, given that you have a very coarse sand, a groundwater flowing at two to maybe four feet per day at some sites? Um, and, and then can you get the EVO to, to, to stay in place and, and, and get that persistence that, that's desired? Uh, a few uh, pilot scale uh, case studies. Um, a water-only injection test was, was applied at this top site. This was a project that I was involved in several years ago, um, which we knew was clay. And this was actually a picture of one of the borings. That, that's some pretty tight, uh, cohesive plastic clay. And, and this project was actually in Australia. Uh, it was below an active building. They had a time frame, high concentrations. And the client uh, wanted me to come to Australia to, to be part of the injection and, and looked at it and said, all right, before I get on a plane and fly around the world, can we even inject fluids into the site? So in this case, we did a water only injection test. Um, and one of the things we learned was direct push injection, which was the initial plan, didn't work at all, just with the clays. Um, but we, we, we were able to do injection with, with uh, injection screens. And as part, also as part of this uh, water only injection test and having the rig out, we did additional um, soil borings. 
and we're able to identify that they were, there were thinner intervals that were sandier clay that were wetter and where most of the, the TC was actually flowing. So for full scale, we actually were able to use injection wells that targeted those, those thinner intervals. Um, and it ended up being a very effective uh, ISCO uh, project. Um, but the water-only injection test and the, the additional data characterization, which was an remedial design investigation that occurred during that same event, really were what made that, that event successful. Uh, this middle one was an SVE pilot test. Uh, it was a project where there was an SVE pilot test planned, but this, the, toil, the soils were much tighter than were anticipated. And, and when the, uh, with the, the initial pilot test, they were using a certain blower that they anticipated using, and they weren't getting good vacuum with that blower. The SVE pilot test trailer had, had a, rank, a different blower of a bigger capacity. So just by being prepared with, with various blowers on that SVE uh, trailer, um, they were able to still do the test while they were mobilized and not lose any schedule and, and still collect the appropriate data in order to design um, a full-scale SVE system. Um, and then getting back to the Cape Cod denitrification, uh, based on the results of that bench scale test, uh, this one community is looking potentially at thousands of feet of PRB um, if they go full scale. So to do a pilot test, they did a 100-foot PRB, um, and which is a fraction of the overall length, to, to evaluate just the logistics. Can you inject at those depths, pressures, flow rates? Um, and then the, the various monitoring going on is looking at distribution of, of the the carbon that was injected, as well as how long is this demonstration test PRB going to last? How many years? Um, so to really help them kind of dial in that cost estimating if they are going full scale. And, and another uh, case study that's near and dear to my part was a, a New England Superfund site uh, that had three contaminant plumes, um, BTEX, chlorinated solvents, 1,4-dioxane, different plumes had different combinations and different concentrations of, of these. Um, and, and we have a very fast track schedule at the time. Um, there was an A-Rod that changed the remedy from pump and treat. It was actually a, a, a field pilot test for pump and treat. Um, and, and we realized there were gonna be numerous challenges to that at this site. Um, so an amended rod was, was uh, put in place with institute chemical oxidation. Um, and, and EPA wanted construction complete within 12 months of, of the, the A-Rod. Um, so there was a remedial design investigation to better dial in where the treatment needed to be happened. And it turns out the, the treatment area extended greatly because the source area was more upgradient than initially thought it was going to be. Um, and, and there was a mobile lab that was mobilized. So we were able to get a high resolution, um, high density, actually quantifiable data. Um, and, and then we did field pilot testing as well. And, and to maintain the, 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 the rapid schedule, um, we, the remedial design needed to be completed within three months of the pilot test injection. So the pilot test, the data quality objections were built around collecting field screening data uh, for sulfate test kits, sulfate, uh, sodium, as well as looking at ORP and connectivity and, and pH because this is space activated for sulfate. Um, and we're able to develop our injection spacing, dosages, ROIs, um, based on that pilot test field screening data uh, in order to maintain that schedule. Um, ultimately, uh, this was the largest field injection of persulfate that was ever done at the time. Uh, and that first event was completed on time, on budget, and actually slightly early in order to EPA to get their construction complete. Um, and then there, there were subsequent uh, multiple rounds of injection, which were anticipated, um, which achieved uh, real significant concentration reduction in, in all the contaminants across the three areas. Um, and then as a result, each of the subsequent uh, injection events was shrunk in size by about 50% each event. Um, and the site's now in a, in a successful m and phase. I'm not going to go through all this either, but you, you all have this a, a, as a kind of a, a guidance about when, when it's optimal and would be recommended to do bench and pilot tests based on um, whether you, what kind of technology you're using, it is a mature technology or an emerging technology. Um, what is your conceptual site model? Is it complex, relatively simple? Is there a simple uh, CSM out there? Um, and then if you've got multiple uh, COCs and, 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 and the like. So remediation design, when you're working on a remediation design report, there's a whole number of, of, of aspects that need to go into that and, and kind of lay these out. And, and a number of the presentations have talked about these and, and, and in terms of the horizontal and vertical limits and, and hopefully you, you can do a remedial design investigation and, and get to the answer of some of these. But one of the, the, 
what I want to spend a little bit of time on now is, is delivery methods and, and what are kind of, how do we implement, implement our technology using the best delivery method for a given site. It's been brought up um, by a few of the uh, presenters today um, that remediation is a contact sport and, and, and it, it is a cliche that we use in our industry. But it's true, and it's it's worthwhile kind of banging that you know being that dead horse and and, and and ringing that bell again. I guess that that's what we we really want in our remedial design and then our remedial actions is that contact. And whether you're doing injection or extraction, you really want to focus the remediation on where the contaminant is, and and that that, that contaminant mass is where it is. It's going to be based on what the contaminants are, what their chemical properties are, well, your soil profile and your geology. Um, and, and, and whether, again, you're, you're extracting uh, fluids or, 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 or air or vapor or, or injecting amendments. Again, it's that contact and delivery and contact and delivery. And I'm going to sound like a broken record a little bit in the next few slides, but it, it is that important. And that's what leads to successful remediation in situ. I just want to take a moment and, 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 and think about and just make sure that we're, we've had it in our head. There's different remediation scales as well. And there's been a, a few different slides earlier. I know Karen had a good one where she had kind of her, 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 her remediation injection points next to that drop of napple. And, and Richard had something, again, looking at different scales in the same plot. But just, just keep in mind that we're often drawing these maps of these dots across of where our injection points or our extraction wells are. Um, but so that's kind of like the remediation scale. But but really, we need to be thinking about what's the geologic scale. Well, we have lenses that maybe only a few inches or a few feet, um, and then also looking down on, on the, the micron or the sand grain and the microbiological scale. We've we've got our Dale Cacoides, uh, one of our heroes of remediation here, and and we're, we're we're preparing these macro scale designs where we're thinking about gallons of that we're going to inject and how many cubic yards we're going to treat, and how many pounds of oxygen we're going to add. Um, but the reactions and the action is happening at, at the microbial and at the geological scale. So again, it's getting that delivery into the scales that we want, despite having these macro scale designs. And, and, and I just want to kind of have us thinking about that um, when, when we're thinking about our delivery tools. And, and there's, there's different tools that, that are available to us. And, and again, we want to think about which one is going to give us the best delivery in your remediation and remedial action based on your remedial design and based on your conceptual site model. So one of the more common, I'm just looking, we're, we're pretty good on time, I think, um, is uh, vertical injection points. And, and that can be done with injection wells or direct push. And they both have advantages. They both have some drawbacks. Um, one of the, the best advantages of direct push is just the flexible layout and you have less IDW from, from soil cuttings. Uh, but they often have geological limitations. Uh, if you've got uh, bedrock or till or boulders, um, you, you may be limited um, with that. Where, where injection wells, if, if, you can, if you have geologic uh, uh, inhibitances, you can come out with a, a bigger rig or a sonic or whatever the case is and put your wells in where you need it. Um, and, and you can adapt wells with, with uh, redevelopment. That's a lot of thing. If you're doing an injection and, and you can get there now, but then when you come back in a few months, the site doesn't look anything like what it looks like when you go out for your first injection. Um, you can manifold or, or, or rework around those. Um, but remember, you have costs for uh, um, installing as well as uh, uh, costs later on to abandon those. Um, and if you've got a larger vertical interval, you may need nested wells or, or multi-level wells. Um, probably a 10-foot uh, screen length is what I would recommend uh, uh, as, as maximum length. But again, that goes back into geology. Uh, if you have two feet of sand and then two feet of silt and then two feet of sand, and maybe all the contaminations in the silt, you definitely don't want to put your a 10 foot screen because your most of your amendment is going to go into the more permeable zones where your contaminant is not. So you want to adjust your your either your direct push injection screens or your 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 injection well screens based on your geology and based on your CSM. And your injection spacing, often it's going to be in a grid pattern, but maybe if it's a PRB, it's only a single row of points. Um, but the geology is really critical to that as well. Um, and, and generally, again, this, this is more when you get into state of the practice where you're not going out and doing site specific bench scale, uh, bench or pilot studies, you're, you're going to want a closer spacing in less permeable soil. Um, I still don't, I'm not a big proponent of, of large radius of influence for injection points. I prefer more points. 
Um, if you're doing wells, there may be a higher cost for that. If you're doing direct push, there's often not any higher injection costs because your cost is really time in the field of your injection team. Um, and I, I really believe that if contact and delivery are, are, are the keys to success, then having more points is, is a good way to get more contact. And if you're thinking about multiple rounds of injection, and, and a lot of in-situ remediation technologies, you do have to assume that, and that's just what it, what it requires to, to, to meet your, your standards. Um, you want to think about uh, wells versus direct push. And, and one of the upsides of, of wells is that you're limiting your cost and your rig disturbance. If, if you're in a residential neighborhood, um, maybe you only want to mobilize your rig once. If, if you've been on sites, and, and how many of us have had sites where there's more utilities that you can count on one hand, um, you may be limited to where you can actually squeeze a point in the ground. So in those cases, you want to find those, those limited points, put the well in there, and then work your remediation around those just based on access. Because we know a lot of times you, you don't have optimal access. We're not at these, these virgin sites that have never been um, utilities, never had any anthropogenic activities. Um, that's, otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for remediation. Um, but if, if another uh, thought uh, to use temporary injection points is the ability to do overlapping treatment uh, and, and really improve that contact and delivery. So if we, if we think here, we've, we've got these red circles and, and that would be our, our, our grid layout of injection points for the first event. Um, if we come out with a second event, we can offset those. So if, if in the first event we were looking at a 15 foot grid, grid spacing, a seven and a half foot radius of influence, well, we can offset that whole grid by seven and a half feet. And now if, if we have two events, we're really, we're achieving almost a, a three and a half foot ROI, but we're, we're getting a, a much better delivery network with that. And we also wanna think about when, when we're doing direct push technology, that there's different tools available to us. Uh, not all injection tooling is, is created equally. And, and this is where we also need to think about where are our contaminants, where are they located, where are they moving. Um, there's, there's, there are some injection, uh, in, in situ injection uh, contractors or based, based on the project, they're just injecting at the bottom of the rods. And, and some sites and, and some, some intervals, that may be adequate. Um, I haven't seen too many where I'm just gonna dump it at the bottom. Um, you're really gonna wanna focus on where your intervals are. Um, there's various retractable screens. Uh, these can be good tools, and you want to think about, again, how long those screens are. Um, sometimes these screens aren't great with really fine-grained materials where the, where this, the, when the, the slots get, get blocked up. Um, there are various pressure-activated tubes uh, tools. They, uh, these are made by Geoprobe and, and others. Um, and you can see here, you, you, you kind of get these pinhole, um, and it, the, it's shot out in, in four or five directions, so that's good. And you you kind of get... Uh, injection in different directions. Um, and then there's also various proprietary screens. This is just a picture of the, the screens that IceTech uses. Um, and and we, we found over years in redeveloping these, um, it's based on a really narrow interval. It's only about a one centimeter diameter um, with 10 slot screens cut 360 degrees around. And, and we, we found, we, we find we get really nice distribution um, at a uh, low pressure um, and, and good vertical distribution as well. So again, whenever you're thinking about doing direct push injection, ask the question about, well, what kind of direct push tooling is gonna be available to me so that you can implement your remedial design. Uh, horizontal wells are another delivery tool available to us and, and they have a lot of value if, if you're going under inaccessible areas, buildings, roads, uh, um, flight lines at, at Air Force bases and, and such. Um, and you can position them at different angles. Uh, and, and the cost of these have come down quite a bit over the last uh, decade or so. Um, and they can be multi-purpose as well. This middle project uh, it was one where ISTEC was involved, where initially there was injections of modified fenton's reagent, which is a catalyzed iron uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then afterwards, they were going to be used for virus barging. Um, and, and one of the, some of the disadvantages and just in terms of the, the disposal of drill cuttings and, and they can be more expensive than vertical wells, but um, they have a lot of advantages. So that's just, a, it's a tool that's available to us. Um, in situ soil mixing, um, if the name of the game is to really maximize uh, contact between the amendment and the contaminants, um, this is your tool. Um, and, and you can apply this to unsaturated as well as saturated soils. Um, and you can use it with, with a whole range of different amendments. 
And there's this different soil mixing tools that are available to us, just like with direct push injection. Um, as simply as just using a bucket, um, you can use augers, uh, that, and that can be vertical or, 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 or uh, on the end of an uh, excavator arm like this one. Um, and then they have those that are single axis or dual axis. So they, they mix, they, they turn and mix in one direction or two directions. Um, and, and each of these methods is going to have different costs associated with them and, and also achieve more or less contact. Um, and some of that's based on the, the budget, the depth, the, the contaminant, the soil types. Um, and if you're in more clay and silt and fines or really heterogeneous, you, you may want something that's going to get um, more mixing. Uh, recirculation is, is another uh, available tool with us, and whether it's a push pull or a closed loop or with its separate injection and extraction. And, and this can be true for both uh, air or for liquids. And injection volume, um, this, this is uh, looking at liquids, but, but it's, I guess the same could be uh, true for sparging or SVE when in terms of for volume exchanges and the like. Um, but so this is, this some of the, the numbers here are, are more directly related to ISCO, but it's true for, for any of your in situ, uh, especially chemical remediation technologies. Um, so two of these studies, uh, Krems and Clayton, this, this goes back to 2010, but they looked at, at 70 plus ISCO sites, and and they they looked at 20% pore volume injected as their threshold, and it was either more or less. And, and they found of those 70 plus sites, the average total injection volume over all the events at any one site was was in the 10 to 15% range. So pretty low across these sites. Uh, it's just showing what we're doing as industry. But they found with 20% as their threshold, um, they had less rebounds and less wells with rebound. So if you can significantly reduce the rebound, it's likely that you're actually achieving more effective uh, contaminant reduction. Um, I often recommend more than 20% pore volume each event. So if, if this is what was happening over the life of the event, I'd like to see 20% injection of the pore volume each event. Um, and then this, the Seagrass et al, they looked at 50% of the pore volume over all of the injections as their threshold. And they were finding, on average, greater than 90% uh, contaminant reduction at sites that did that. So with an ISCO site, you're often planning on two, maybe three injections. Um, and if you're doing more than 20% each event, then therefore you're, you're definitely doing more than Crimson Clayton recommend. And you're probably getting up into this 50% uh, poor volume. Um, and if we, this is often where we're always looking to how do we, how do we cut costs for our client? But if we're injecting less volume, and maybe doing less less amendment. Well, you're doing less cost, but you're you're also in the, in that getting less treatment. And I think these studies uh, show less less success. So we have to think about when when we're cutting costs. Are we really cutting costs? Um, I forget who said it, but once uh, told me that remediation is only expensive when it doesn't work. Um, and and so we don't want to have projects where we go out and do a whole new design and spend a whole lot of money doing remediation. And then have to go back and say, well, well, why didn't that work? And and maybe good for Isotech, but not for the industry. There's been a number of projects the last few years where we were involved early at the bench in the pilot, and then they decided to go elsewhere for the full scale. And then we got a call a year later and said, well, we did the full scale, and, and we'd like you to come back now. Um, again, just thinking about our sensitive receptors, um, whether you're under a building, you've got utilities nearby, uh, potable water, surface water. Um, and, and just thinking about um, remediation and, and if we're uh, stalling with our remediation. And there's a couple of reasons that that can occur. Maybe remedial goals haven't been met, uh, or maybe the treatment's no longer active. Maybe your oxidants are consumed. Maybe the conditions are no longer favorable for bioremediation. So we have to think about, well, what do we do to, to, to get the remediation going again? And, and what kind of change in conditions do we really need? Um, and maybe it's we're continuing with selected remedy, and maybe we just need to reapply. Maybe a little bit another injection of oxidant, maybe another injection of of, of vegetable oil or, or 3DME, the Regenesis product. Um, maybe we need to optimize the current approach. Maybe we need some pH buffer. Maybe we want to do bio augmentation, or maybe we're just changing out the car at that point, and we're completely changing the remediation technology. And and change in course, um, and and whether it's it's reactive. Um, and we want to change, or we actually want to be able to have a proactive combined remedy. Um, you want to allow flexibility into your both feasibility study and your remedial design. None of us have a crystal ball to know what's going to happen five, 10 years down the line. And 
we'd love to all say, all right, we're going to we're going to do our injection or we're going to do our air spars and, and we're going to close the site out in five years. Um, and if, if that was the case, then then that would be phenomenal. But we know that's not the you know what happens in our industry. Um, so that's where we want to leave that flexibility in. and 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 whether at the FS and, and the rod level or decision document, make sure that you're selecting a technology and not an amendment. I've seen a lot of rods that, that specifically specify permanganate or specifically specify EVO, where that, that may be not the best amendment for, for reasons X, Y, and Z. Um, and and, and I've, I've even been involved in FSs, which went, went to the rod, is where the alternative was in situ injection. And it, and it, it said it could be ISCO, it could be bio, it could be uh, either in sequence or maybe ISCO in the source area, bio in the down gradient plume. So leave that flexibility in it. And even if you can have a sentence or two in the rod or the feasibility study that that's maybe even an option, it does open yourself up to, to not needing so much rigor later on um, to, to reopen that. Um, such that you can harness the, the benefits of, of multiple technologies. Um, and if you're thinking about proactive uh, combined remedies, think about what we can do to avoid um, uh, adverse impacts. Make sure that uh, different technologies are implemented in such a way that, again, they're synergistic and can be implied in sequence, and not that you do one thing and all of a sudden you're down the road and say, well, we could have done this technology now, but we we already did this, and, and now this is going to be really hard to do this technology, which would be a great fit now. So just a, a few summary uh, take-home points. Um, we really want to think about our remedial design um, and getting appropriate characterization. And then once we have our design, which is built upon a, a hopefully a solid conceptual site model, then you're choosing the, the right deli delivery tools for that design. Um, and focus on the geology. Um, bench and pilot scale uh, tests are important. And, and a failed test of either of these is not without value or lessons. Um, and collaborate with your technology experts and, and contractors, whether it's myself, Maureen, or some of our, our analogous uh, folks out in the industry. Um, even as early as starting your feasibility study, your, your technology screening, let us help you think about what's going to be implementable, what's going to be effective. Help us help help let us help you dial in the cost so we're not you're not putting one cost in the feasibility study, and then when you do your remedial design, it's it's an order of magnitude more. Um, that's the last thing any of our clients want to see. Um, and just allow flexibility in your design, your feasibility studies, and, and your remedy selection. Um, because there are always changes, there's always uncertainty, there's always things we learn along the way. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we can take some of these best practices and, and lead to more successful remediation. Thank you. <laughs> Great, okay. So everybody's probably frazzled, but does anybody have Question for Paul. <laughs> you can answer, Paul. It's a long end of the day. So, okay, question. Repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the question is the sites that, that I get involved in. Um, do I find that there's, there, there's good characterization or is that you have to get more data? Um, so my my time in the industry was 12 plus years as a consultant and then now two and a half years as a contractor. Um, and and I wish most of the sites I worked on were well characterized. Uh, Richard showed that slide of some of the data he'd like to see on the sites. I wish I had half of that on, on most sites. Um, so unfortunately, state of the practice is, is making some guesses about what things are, um, trying to connect dots. Um, but the, 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 the better projects have more characterization of the treatment areas, not just of, of the extents. Um, and then just kind of another plug is that the best projects, and I think Maureen would agree with this, are where the consultants and the, the contractors and the amendment suppliers are working collaboratively um, throughout the process. Okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you, Water Bottle. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.